On June 25, 2007, police in a suburb of Atlanta were called to the Benoit house. Inside, they found Nancy Benoit and seven-year-old Daniel strangled in their beds. Chris Benoit was hanging in his home gym, suspended from the neck by the steel cables he used for his workouts. Hi, uh, my name is Dennis Fig, and I'm a retired detective in New York City. I run the security for World Wrestling, and one of our wrestlers that lives down there is missing. And he told me to just to say we need a welfare check done. And what's his name? Uh, Chris Benoit. Police say Benoit murdered his wife and son on the weekend, then killed himself. His career will speak for itself, but his record as a human being is first and foremost, and those actions will never be forgotten. It struck me as somewhat bizarre that perhaps he would even be in the home with their deceased bodies for something like that. I think that he was one of those guys that was he was he was so passionate about the business almost to a fault. The story of Chris Benoit is one of universal horror and tragedy. However, the dark truth is that in America, there are more than 16,000 murders committed every year, many of which never even make the news. So what made this case so significant? Why all these years later are fans and experts alike still debating the circumstances surrounding the incident, and why through all the scientific experiments and police investigations, are some questions surrounding the Benoit's double murder-suicide still unanswered? He carried his son on a pedestal. He loved that boy. You can watch any pay-per-view event, any time he went a match, he had his son in the ring with him. And I just cannot fathom the idea that, this, that he done anything to this family. In this video, I want to take a look at the man behind the outstanding in-ring career. I want to try to understand the reasoning behind his actions and ask what could drive someone to commit such a heinous and senseless act of brutality. Chris Benoit was an elite athlete, a man of unthinkable commitment and dedication who had risen to the very top of his field. One of the prominent figures within the world of pro wrestling, Benoit had achieved greatness in the eyes of fans and his wrestling peers alike across a career spanning more than two decades. Initially training under infamous stretcher Stu Hart in 1985 at the notorious Hart Family Dungeon, a path taken by countless notable names from the Canadian wrestling scene, Benoit would go on to make his in-ring debut for Stampede Wrestling in Calgary in November of that year. Benoit came to the ring under the moniker Dynamite Chris Benoit, an homage to his favourite wrestler, the Dynamite Kid. In this debut, for the first time, we see the inception of a move which would follow Benoit through his entire career, and one which later may hold huge explanations as to why this well-respected pro wrestler would go on to brutally murder his family. And now, in the modern day, we can ask, would things have ended differently if Benoit indeed had never used the diving headbutt after his initial botched landing? Perhaps. What we now know is that Benoit moved on from Stampede Wrestling and travelled to Japan to progress on his pro wrestling journey. In New Japan Pro Wrestling, Benoit found himself facing off against in-ring legends such as Jushin Thunder Liger and Shinjiro Otani, and really began to hit his stride as a wrestler in the Japanese Junior Heavyweight Division. At this time, Benoit adopted a mask and the persona Pegasus Kid for much of his run in New Japan something which he has stated that he initially despised but eventually came to see the Pegasus mask as part of his character and key to his initial success. Though trips back to America would see Chris Benoit spreading his popularity in ECW and briefly WCW, Benoit wouldn't arrive on the American wrestling scene until he accepted a prestigious invitation to join Ric Flair's historic faction, the Four Horsemen, in World Championship Wrestling where he returned after an initial short stint. A move which would see Benoit featured alongside some of the biggest names in the wrestling world anywhere. 
over the next five years, Benoit would feature as a singles wrestler and as part of several teams, all the while developing his aggressive in-ring style and unmatched physical conditioning. At this time, Benoit was paired in a storyline with a performer simply known as Woman, a beautiful valet who immediately had great chemistry with one another. This woman's name was Nancy Toffoloni, and in a few short years would become Chris's second wife, immortalised as Nancy Benoit. By 2000, WCW had collapsed and its stars were making the switch to WWE. Benoit was one of the first to make the move, alongside Eddie Guerrero, Perry Saturn and Dean Malenko in an elite group of athletes known as the Radicals. From these four talented men, Eddie Guerrero and Chris Benoit were the ones who stood out and were propelled to stardom. Benoit soon moved on to win the illustrious Intercontinental title through a classic feud with Chris Jericho. Continuing to move up the card, Benoit then faced off against The Rock and solidified his spot atop the card with classic matches against Kurt Angle and Eddie. During his first attempt at the top belt in WWE, Chris Benoit faced off against Brock Lesnar and lost after being caught in Lesnar's then brand new Brock Lock submission. This led to a feud between Benoit and Lesnar's manager, Paul Heyman, who had history from their time working together in ECW. When Benoit earned his spot in the 2004 Royal Rumble, Paul Heyman served him with the number one entrance spot, all but guaranteeing Benoit's demise in the match. However, as WWE really strapped the proverbial rockets to Benoit's boot, he put on a clinic, displaying every skill that he'd learnt across his long and arduous journey to this point. Almost godlike conditioning meant Benoit was throwing people around for the entire match. Through every other contestant, he stood strong and, in a moment of fantastic storytelling, eliminated the big show last and won the Royal Rumble. His prize, a chance to challenge for the World Heavyweight title at WrestleMania 20. A triple threat match between WWE Golden Boy Shawn Michaels, champion Triple H and Chris Benoit, who in the eyes of so many, was the true underdog in the fight. In front of 20,000 rabid fans inside MSG, the unimaginable happened and Benoit caught the champion with his crippler crossface submission and deservedly won the World Heavyweight Championship and was the first man to ever win a WrestleMania main event by submission. A truly powerful moment, one filled with joy and positive emotions, but now in the modern day, as we look back on Chris Benoit celebrating in the ring with his best friend by his side, the two smiling from ear to ear, shedding tears of joy. It's so hard not to feel that darkness. Within a matter of years from this photo, both men would be dead, leaving in their wake despair and devastation. Benoit's career with WWE would continue to be that of title reigns and success within the ring, seemingly until his very last days. As we take a look at the timeline of the Benoit family murders, I want to start first with some text messages which Benoit sent on the night of the tragedy and see how this infamous story began to unfold. On Saturday 23rd of June, Jarvo Guerrero, nephew of Eddie and close friend of Chris Benoit and his family, received a voicemail from Benoit who said that he had overslept and missed a flight, meaning that he would undoubtedly be late for the night's upcoming wrestling show in Texas. When Guerrero phoned Benoit back around 3.30pm, Chris sounded tired, groggy and a little slurred, but stuck to his story of oversleeping. After hanging up the call, Chavo Guerrero felt something was off with the tone of the conversation and rang Chris back around 12 minutes later. Benoit did not answer the call and Guerrero left a message asking Benoit to call back. He eventually called Chavo back around 3.44pm and explained he was busy changing his flights and had been through a stressful day with his son and wife, being sick from food poisoning. Scott Armstrong, a man who frequently travelled with Benoit to shows, says that Benoit called him around the same time and explained that Nancy was vomiting blood and that Daniel was also vomiting. Um, I call him, no answer. Then all of a sudden I get a, a call from him. And he's like, oh, call right back. Hey, Chavo, hey, what's up, man? He sounds just off. I'm like, man, you okay? He's like, yeah, I'm, I'm cool, man. Just, just really bad. 
a really, really just bad weekend. I just, you know, Daniel and Nancy are sick, his wife, you know, and, you know. Uh, so you're actually talking to him at this point. I'm in talking time. to him, yeah. And, he's, and this and, is basically after he's probably killed his wife. Uh, yes. Yeah. Yes. They're sick, you know, they're not feeling good. And I'm like, all right, all right, cool. And well, are you coming in? Yeah, I, I missed my flight. I missed my flight. But don't worry, I'm going to catch another flight and, and I'll be there. Okay, I could just call me when you get in and. I'll pick you up, you know, no matter what time it is. You know, I we were landing in Houston. I had to drive to Belmont. And um, I was like, you know, don't worry about it. We're late. We're late. I'll, I'll wait for you. Okay, okay. So he gets off the – he getting ready to get off the phone. And and he goes – he makes a point. Of, it stops. He goes, chavo, chavo. I go, yeah. And he goes, I love you. I said, I love you too, man. It wasn't too odd, you know, off – off kilter because mm-hmm. we always tell each other we love each other. Yeah. But this one was really forced. It was not, it was not forced. It was really like made a point of it. It was like, Hey man, okay. I love you brother. Okay. No, it was like Chavo. I love you. I want you to understand this. Basically. Mm-hmm. Yeah, if you Don't if you, forget this. Coming from a man with very few words. Yeah. Yeah. I was like, all right, I love you too, bro. So I hung up and I thought that was strange. So I call him right back and I go, Hey man, are you, are you all right? I'm fine, man. Like I said, I just had a a real hard weekend, you know, and and, and just you know, you know, real hard weekend, and they, they, you know, I had to go to the, take him, you know, Nad, Daniel and Nancy to the hospital, and I'm like, oh, okay, man. Well, I'm here. Okay, okay, man. Okay, cool, cool. So then, hung up, and that was the last I actually talked to him. Chris Benoit called WWE Talent Relations, explaining the situation as to why he'd missed the house show without notice and how he had taken both Nancy and Daniel to the hospital as their conditions worsened. Benoit explained that he had booked a later flight and would make it into Houston in time for his match against CM Punk for the ECW World Title at Vengeance Night of Champions. The following day, Chavo awoke at 5.30am on the morning of the murders to a text message alert on his phone. It was a simple and not very out of the ordinary message plainly stating the dogs are in the enclosed pool area and the back door is open, from Chris Benoit, followed by details of his home address. Then a minute later, a message came through to Chavo from Nancy Benoit's phone with the exact same text. The dogs are in the enclosed pool area and the back door is open. At the time, Chavo Guerrero says he thought little of the messages as he believed it to refer to the fact that Chavo was meeting Benoit the next day. In the morning, when Chavo couldn't get in touch with Benoit, he knew something was wrong. Chavo said, I think he texted me after everything happened, after everything went down, the passing of his wife and son. He was texting me, going, hey, this is how you can find me. I think he texted me probably right before he committed suicide. At this point, Chavo went to management at WWE, speaking with John Laurinaitis, the WWE's Senior Vice President of Talent Relations, and explained the situation. This is when he began to show others the text messages and became extremely concerned. The WWE knew something was up. His lack of communication and non-attendance was completely out of character. Scheduled for a live event in Beaumont, Texas, and it was very much unlike Chris not to make live events. And that yet. was on Saturday, correct? Yes, that's right. correct. Uh, and from there, uh, our office contacted uh, Chris to try and rearrange flights and things of that nature so that he would come in on Sunday for the pay-per-view and actually late that Saturday night uh, into the pay-per-view in Texas. And uh, that was the last we heard of him. The flight was changed and obviously we didn't, when he didn't show up on Sunday, we knew that there was something drastically wrong because his M.O. was definitely to make all of his engagements. He was a consummate professional from a business standpoint. Uh, so we knew something was, was really wrong. Benoit failed to show up once again to the pay-per-view and the collective alarm bells began to ring. At this point, the welfare team began to make calls to inquire about Benoit's situation, making a call to a local police station in the town where Chris's family were living. It's spelled B-E-N-O-I-T. Okay, and he's a, a wrestler? Yes, he's, what, what happened, he's a very religious gentleman, and yesterday he was supposed to show up at a pay-per-view and never got on the plane, never showed up. They tried to reach his wife, Nancy, she doesn't answer, they tried to call his house. It's, unlo- it's, it's out of character for him. When no contact could be made with Benoit or his family, the house was breached by police, who even with their years of combined experience, were mortified by what they found. 
Well, the wrestling world in shock today. Former champion Chris Benoit found dead in his Atlanta home along with his wife and young son. In one upstairs bedroom, they found the body of Nancy wrapped in a towel with all of her limbs tied. Her body already showing signs of decomposition and evidence that she was strangled from the bruising left on her back and neck. In another bedroom, Chris Benoit's third son Daniel was found strangled to death and laying in his bed. Chris Benoit's body was found strangled, hanging lifeless from his weight machine in his gym, the cord wrapped around his throat and the counterweights released in order to cause death by hanging. Word of this gruesome triplet of deaths quickly spread and news made its way back to WWE. Around 4.15pm, WWE were formally notified by the police that the investigation was underway after they had discovered three bodies at the Benoit home and the house was now ruled as a major crime scene. Cops saying in a press conference just a couple of hours ago that they found the wrestler hanging by a pulley on some exercise equipment in his home gym. This has been so devastating as a, as a father and a grandfather and a father figure to all those associated with uh, our brand. This is not what we're about. What we're about is putting smiles on people's faces. This is the opposite of what we do. We're entertainers. We entertain people all over the world and we put smiles on faces. That's our job description. Not something like this to be tainted and smeared with this. Wanting to be the first to break the news and control the narrative, WWE began to release information about the death via its mobile alert service and website. A statement read, World Wrestling Entertainment was informed today by authorities in Fayette County, Georgia, that WWF superstar Chris Benoit, his wife, Nancy, and his son were found dead in their home. Authorities are investigating, but no other details are available at this time. Instead of its announced programming for tonight on USA Network, WWE will air a three-hour tribute to Chris Benoit. Chris was beloved among his fellow superstars and was a favourite amongst WWE fans for his unbelievable athleticism and wrestling ability. He always took great pride in his performance and always showed respect for the business he loved, for his peers and towards his fans. This is a terrible tragedy and an unbearable loss. WWE extends its sincere condolences and prayers to the surviving members of the Benoit family and their loved ones in this time of tragedy. Carl DeMarco, president of WWE Canada noted, I'm deeply saddened over the loss of Chris Benoit. My heartfelt thoughts and sympathy go out to his parents and family. My relationship with Chris has extended many years and I consider him a great friend. Chris was always first class warm, friendly, caring and professional, one of the best in our business. As a tribute, WWE replaced the scheduled Raw show with segments from the DVD Hard Knocks, the Chris Benoit story, highlights from Benoit's classic matches and sad interviews with those who knew him best, all to pay honour to the in-ring legacy of one of WWE's greatest all-time performers. However, as the sombre show drew to its conclusion, the dark tale of the Benoit's deaths took a turn which nobody at the time saw coming. ABC News had breaking information from the Sheriff's Department in Fayetteville County who stated, The deaths were being investigated as a possible murder-suicide. The instruments of death were located on the scene. Police now treating the discovery as a double murder-suicide. This led WWE's PR teams going into overdrive and releasing the following message on their corporate website. It has been ruled that the deaths of Chris Benoit, his wife Nancy and their son Daniel earlier today were the results of a double murder-suicide from within the home. At the time, Tuesday nights for WWE meant ECW. Before its scheduled programming, the company aired a statement from company owner Vincent McMahon who explained the following. Good evening ladies and gentlemen. Last night on Monday Night Raw, the WWE presented a special tribute show, recognising the career of Chris Benoit. However, now some 26 hours later, the facts of this horrific tragedy are now apparent. Therefore, other than my comments, there will be no mention of Mr Benoit's name tonight. On the contrary, tonight's show will be dedicated to everyone who has been affected by this terrible incident. The idea of not mentioning Chris Benoit's name is something that, in the time since, 
WWE have remained very strong-minded about, with the company, understandably, aiming to put as much distance from their brand and this horrific incident as possible. Whilst I can completely understand WWE's stance on the situation, I feel that there are some downsides to their blanket ban on any and all references to Chris Benoit. Firstly, and perhaps most controversially, I want to ask, is it okay to separate the art from the artist? Is it possible to sit back and enjoy matches which feature arguably one of pro wrestling's greatest ever stars, or is the knowledge of these heinous acts too much to bear for some? For me, I know that I would struggle to sit and watch anything even remotely related to Benoit without my mind seemingly thinking about all that has happened. The other downside to removing all of Benoit's content is that any wrestler who featured in these segments and matches through no fault of their own also have their achievements tarnished simply due to their proximity to Chris Benoit. Again, this is not a black and white issue, but one which I think is important to raise, at the very least in the hopes that it can spark a conversation on the topic. It's undeniable that Chris Benoit had some of the most innovative and entertaining wrestling matches throughout the era, every single one of them overshadowed by the realities of his crimes. David Benoit, Chris Benoit's surviving son, said, It's terrible, man. It's just terrible. I would like the WWE to remember him, at least for the good times. I want him in the Hall of Fame. I still today can't fathom that he could do this. As members from the Fayetteville County Sheriff's Department attended what they described as a major crime scene, they were able to ascertain certain facts about the murders straight away. The crime report submitted by District Attorney Ballard and the City Sheriff explains how Chris Benoit committed suicide by hanging. His body was found hanging by the pulley cable of a weight machine, which he had modified in order to kill himself. On the Talk is Jericho podcast in 2016, Sandra Toffoloni, Nancy Benoit's sister, said that a forensic search of Benoit's computer later found search results for quickest and easiest way to break your neck. Nancy's body showed clear signs of strangulation. She had bruising in the middle of her back, which heavily suggested that Chris Benoit used his knee to force pressure onto his wife while cutting off her air supply. Nancy had a pool of blood beneath where her head lay, which police say could be an indication of her last-ditch struggle against her attacker. Toxicology reports discovered alcohol in Nancy's system, but at such small levels to have been negligible. The report also showed small quantities of hydrocodone and, and alprazolam in her bloodstream, but not enough to confirm that Nancy had been sedated before her gruesome demise. Furthermore, Daniel's toxicology report showed that he had been heavily sedated with Xanax and was almost certainly not conscious at the time of his murder. Daniel's body was found to have internal bruising to his throat, but showed no signs of a struggle before his death. One sad fact which became apparent as more forensic analysis arrived back from the lab was that Nancy's body had begun to decompose much more than Daniel's. A clear indicator that Chris Benoit had killed his wife many hours, maybe even days, before he killed himself and his son. From their wealth of experience, the local police were satisfied that the Benoit murders was an open and shut case in regards to the actions that took place. Nobody except Benoit was ever suspected officially in relation to the murders, regardless of what some internet misinformation may tell you. The photographs from the crime scene are perhaps not what you'd expect when you hear of a father horrifically murdering his family. The home seemed inviting, well maintained and a great place for a family to live. There wasn't blood splattered on the walls or demonic messages left in cryptic lettering around the house. This kitchen, this living room. These bedrooms, they could all be rooms where any affluent American family might live. Through the fact that the house was in such neat condition when the police arrived, paired with the fact that the murders and suicide had taken place across a number of days, meant that the police soon realised that this crime was one of deliberation and planning, and not of the rage-induced mania which so many in the media had begun to speculate on. A husband, wife, and their young child dead, an apparent double murder-suicide. At the time of the incident, the internet was alive with rumours and theories about what took place and the possible causes. 
many conspiracy theorists trawled over minute details surrounding the case and drew their own conclusions, often without proper facts or evidence to support their claims. One mystery that surrounded the murders was a post made on Wikipedia. A website notable for the fact that it's able to be edited by anyone following verification from a moderator. One such post was created by an anonymous user who declared that Chris Benoit was replaced by Johnny Nitro for the ECW World Championship match at Vengeance as Benoit was not there due to personal issues stemming from the death of his wife Nancy. The issue that had so many perplexed and led to a whole host of offshooting rumours was that this post was created at 4.01am on June the 25th, a full ten and a half hours before the police discovered the bodies at the Fayette County home. What made the claims all the more credible was that when the anonymous poster's IP was identified, it brought back an interesting location. A Wikipedia official, Carrie Bass, said Thursday that the entry was made by someone using an internet protocol address registered in Stamford, Connecticut, where World Wrestling Entertainment is based. The story was picked up by Fox News and went somewhat viral, with the police hunting for the person responsible for the Wikipedia post in the hopes of finding out more information about the deaths. Eventually, local police were able to seize computer equipment from the man held responsible for the postings and began to investigate the connection. Speculation was rife amongst the online wrestling community, with prominent figure Dave Meltzer explaining it might have been merely a coincidence stemming from an innocent, if macabre, chatroom joke. However, it soon came to light when, the following day, the original poster came forward and made a statement about the situation. I posted the comment we're all talking about and I'm here to explain that this was a huge coincidence and nothing more, the poster said, declining to reveal their identity. That night I found out that what I posted ended up actually happening, a one in 10,000 chance. I was beyond wrong for posting wrongful information and I'm sorry to everyone for this. I just posted something that was at the time a piece of wrong unsourced information. I didn't know anything about the Benoit tragedy. It was a terrible coincidence that I never saw coming. The police released the man without pressing charges, but called him an unbelievable hindrance. However, as with most sensationalized news these days, the main story of a potential connection between the Benoit crimes and the Wikipedia post were repeated far more often and far more loudly than the retraction and eventual truth of the case, leading us to today where these rumours and misinformation can still be found amongst message boards, posts and YouTube comments. Concussions, it could be rage, it could be demonic possession for all I know. Maybe. There's no real closure on that. As humans, when we suffer severe trauma in our lives, one aspect which many experience real trouble with is the struggle to understand why. Why did this unfortunate thing happen to me? Why would this person who I thought I knew so well commit such an act? It can leave the victims and those affected by the aftermath of a crime left with a deep-rooted desire to find out the reasonings and get a better understanding of why things played out the way they did. I think somehow Chris got in some sort of trouble. I don't know what it was, I don't know what it was after or whatever, but I think something happened. I think when he got home, Nancy and his son were already dead. This urge to seek the truth has meant that in the years since the Benoit family tragedy, countless news outlets and online voices have aired their ideas, research and opinions on what they think drove a well-respected family man to stray so far onto the path of evil. Okay, taking pills and all that juice, okay. She threatened to leave him, he flipped out, fucking did the deed. Woke up, came to, realized what the fuck was going on. Oh shit, I just killed my wife. He gave his kid his annex, there was annex found in the little boy system, right? He gave the kid his annex so he'd fall asleep, then choked him out. Wrestling business icon Eric Bischoff spoke about the desire for the public to find the truth and the way in which the media fueled the flames with sensationalist reporting and falsehoods. He said, It's clear that the media wants to blame steroids, professional wrestling, Vince McMahon or anyone or anything else that further sensationalizes this family tragedy. 
I refuse to join the choir. I don't have enough information. I wasn't there. I'm not a psychiatrist. I just can't imagine how or why this could have ever happened. He was the politest person I've ever met. I mean, it was always yes ma'am, no ma'am. I mean, he wasn't rude to anybody. He was always talking about his kids and when they were coming to visit and what they were going to do. Did it ever seem like he had a temper? No. Never. But since that statement, much more information has presented itself and those closest to the trauma have come together to pull their knowledge on Benoit's situation, as well as combining studies undertaken by leading scientists to present less rumour and more cold, hard fact. Do I feel like he lost his mind in his final days? One night, you know, Chris ended up killing his wife and his kid. One mystery which arose at the time of the murders surrounded the lack of a suicide note left by Chris Benoit at the scene. The police searched the property but found no last message explaining his thoughts. This small detail, which police say is incredibly unusual from a suicide case, sparked rumours online that the crime was in fact an elaborate setup in order to murder Chris Benoit and his family perpetrated by a crime syndicate as retribution for some unknown wrongdoing. However, in the time since, an unlikely and unfortunate event occurred to quash these rumours. Chris Benoit's first wife, Martina Benoit, became the next of kin following the double murder suicide and received a number of their personal possessions once they had been cleared for forensics. Prominent wrestling journalist Dave Meltzer explained, there was a note that was found in a Bible by the mother of Chris's two children who lives in Canada. The Bible was mixed in with Chris's personal belongings that were shipped to them. The note seemingly fit what police would call a suicide letter and contained details of how Chris was struggling before the event. We can only assume that Benoit wanted the note to be found, but somehow the police missed it hidden in the Bible during their search. What did you think about it then? I was grasping for anything. The world was very black. I mean, we were, we were, we didn't even know how to deal with this. According to Michael Benoit, father of Chris, he had a handwritten notation in there saying, I'm preparing to leave this earth. Speculation is running wild. Did steroids play a role or is there another explanation? There were a lot of prescription medication. As soon as news began to break of the Benoit family murders, one of the key talking points were the steroids found within the home of Chris Benoit by police. It was an open secret that Chris Benoit was heavily involved with the use of steroids, both prescribed and illegal. Other wrestlers have since come forward to confirm the suspicions that Benoit's body was the result of countless hours of hard work in the gym, supported by a potent mixture of performance-enhancing drugs. High concentrations of testosterone cypionate, a form of synthetic anabolic steroid, were found in Chris Benoit's body during his autopsy. The police investigators assumed that, due to the elevated amounts found, Benoit would have taken the steroids close to his time of death. No evidence of human growth hormones were ever found in Benoit's body, however. So the debate then is not whether Benoit was indeed supplied with and regularly consuming large quantities of these substances, but if indeed these chemicals induced a rage upon him which caused him to act in such a violent manner. In 2007, WWE's chief attorney Jerry McDevitt spoke about how Benoit had been legally prescribed testosterone replacement therapy, a practice which McDevitt referred to as a common medical practice for people who had used steroids in the past and had suffered testicular damage as a result. News outlets rushed to report an apparent connection between the use of anabolic steroids in Benoit's case and a form of induced psychosis known as roid rage, something which, immediately following the murders, WWE spoke out publicly about to strongly deny. Well, when police got to the home, they found Chris Benoit's body, his wife's body, and his child's body. They also found steroids in the home. And when asked by reporters if the steroids could have played any part in the murder-suicide, the DA, Scott Ballard, said, quote, We don't know yet. This is one of the things that we'll be looking at. And yet, almost immediately after, the WWE comes out with a statement saying steroids, quote, were not and could not be related to the cause of death. How could you possibly know that? The report, the toxicology reports are out. They're not going to come back for several weeks. So how can you so definitively say steroids played no part? 
And obviously this is not an act of rage. It's an act of deliberation when you do something like this over three days. It's not an act of rage, be it steroid rage or roid rage, whatever it's called, or any other rage. Jerry McDever also disagrees with the suggestion that the crime was perpetrated under the influence of said rage. He said, I believe the facts of this crime do not support the hypothesis that roid rage played a role in the murders. Many have pointed to the facts as proof that Benoit was indeed not in a blind rage during the incident. He had searched out ways to kill himself in the time leading up to the crime. He had killed Nancy perhaps a day before he killed Daniel. He placed Bibles by their corpses and the rest of the house was tidy and clean. None of this evidence points to a man on a rampage. Gary Wadler, an expert on performance enhancing drugs who worked on the World Anti-Doping Agency's prohibited list, shares a similar view saying that was a premeditated act and that's not rage. The media attention surrounding such a high profile case allowed for police to cast a wide net when undergoing their investigations. New York prosecutors seized the opportunity to analyse shipments being sent to several addresses where Chris Benoit stayed during his travels around the country. Two companies, Signature Pharmacy and Medex Life, which were both proven to sell human growth hormone and other grey area steroids online, had sent three deliveries to Benoit in 2005 and 6 as well as a whole host of other controlled substances to a list of pro wrestlers over the previous five years. The owner of these companies were investigated and the case brought to court with all allegations of criminal sale of a controlled substance being denied. They all pled not guilty. And that isn't where the investigation stopped. Between 2007 and 2009, the United States House Committee on Oversight and Government Reform began to collect evidence regarding WWE and their treatment of drugs and medicine within the company. This led the chairman of the board, Henry Waxman, making a formal plea to the office of the National Drug Control Policy Chief, John P. Walters, who said, examine steroid use in professional wrestling and take appropriate steps to address this problem. In the first year of WWE's testing program, which began in March of 2006, 40% of wrestlers were tested positive for steroids and other drugs, even after being warned in advance that they were going to be tested. This led to creation of WWE's wellness policy, a statute which sets out to guide and enforce strict rules about prohibited substances within the company and has been in place ever since. Following the death of Eddie Guerrero and the medical complications surrounding the tragedy, WWE imposed its wellness policy in February of 2006. As is outlined on its corporate website, WWE's general drug policy states, the non-medical use and associated abuse of prescription medications and performance enhancing drugs, as well as the use, possession and or distribution of the illegal drugs by WWE talent are unacceptable and prohibited by this policy, as is the use of masking agents or diuretics taken to conceal or obscure the use of prohibited drugs. Here is a list of all the current banned WWE substances. Ten wrestlers were the first major scandal for performance enhancing after the new policy came into place. The next year, in 2007, Edge publicly admitted to taking steroids on the television show Off The Record. Johnny Nitro stating that he regularly used testosterone amongst other substances. Randy Orton, whose name was printed amongst a list of other wrestlers who were supplied steroids from a pharmacy, which was published in 2007 by Sports Illustrated magazine. Rey Mysterio and Mr. Kennedy, who said on the incident, We do not take drugs. We have a drug policy in place and get tested regularly. I do not take steroids. All of whom were amongst those suspended from WWE. Since then, there has been a whole number of different reported users of performance enhancers in WWE, with many athletes serving suspensions for banned substances since the wellness policy was introduced. The use of performance enhancers and steroids in sports is such a wide spanning and complex topic with seemingly countless varied opinions on their historical and continued use. 
Some PEDs, as we spoke about previously, are perceived by the mass public in very different lights, due to their history of use in different cultures and accepted different levels of threat from the substance's consumption. Is it wrong to have a doctor inject you with a chemical which you've been told is totally legal, albeit with some risks of side effects, in order to heal quicker from an injury sustained in the ring and get back to earning money for yourself and your loved ones? What about when the substance becomes banned due to new research and understanding? What happens then? Not all in sports and pro wrestling are negative about the use of steroids in a controlled way, rather seeing their potential as an aid to their performer's health. The findings themselves state that Chris Benoit had the brain of an 85-year-old man with dementia. And I would suggest to you that from a layman's standpoint, Chris Benoit could not do what he did for a living. He could not function as a normal human being. He couldn't even go to the airport if, in fact, that report were accurate. Another hot topic for debate surrounding the crime was whether or not Benoit was even fully aware of his actions. Those who knew Chris the closest spoke of him as a polite and kind man. One of few words who was collected and calm. However, his final actions were anything but. So, could there be a reason for seemingly such a drastic change in behaviour? Ex-Tough Enough contestant and WWE performer Chris Nowinski thinks so. Since leaving the wrestling business with severe concussions, Nowinski has focused his time on researching CTE, the idea that over the course of an athlete's career, a person can sustain so many unacknowledged concussions as to permanently and severely damage their brain. From boxers to American football players, we see more and more often these long-lasting effects, and as Christopher Nowinski and many others like him continue to discover more about CTE, we see that this problem with long-term brain damage runs much deeper than anyone could have predicted. The reason that I was really wanted to look into this case was because Chris had told me that, you know, we talked about our concussion histories, that he had more than he could count. It wasn't him. It definitely wasn't, said David Benoit, Chris's surviving son. He would never do that. I know he wouldn't. I think something went terribly wrong. The doctor said he had CTE. That's what, at the beginning, gave me some closure. It just made my life a little easier. Didn't have to think about it. He had CTE. I don't think it was him. It blows my mind. All the chair shots he took, not protecting himself. Forensic neuropathologist Dr. Bennett Omelu said, The science tells us that jumping off of 10-foot ladders and slamming people with tables and chairs is simply bad for the brain. The human body is not supposed to land that way. Flair had the dubious honour of witnessing the diving headbutt firsthand on many occasions throughout his career, in countless bouts against another legend and the man who invented the move. King Harley Race, a man who to anyone with a passing interest in the history of wrestling needs no introduction. To the rest, Harley Race is an icon amongst icons. Harley Race was also often credited with the invention and evolution of the diving headbutt. A wrestling move that is now entangled in discussions about serious head injuries in pro wrestling and even death had a much simpler and more innocent genesis than its long and troubled history first suggests. Somewhere in the early 1970s, handsome Harley Race could be found defying the laws of big men style wrestling at the time by frequenting the top rope to perform a devastating splash onto his unfortunate victims. In one match, however, the otherwise dependable ring general had climbed the corner turnbuckle only to slip on the second rope. Without time to consider, Race adjusted his body and slammed down hard with his head into his prone opponent, stealing the pinfall and the interest from the crowd in attendance. Although before his death in 2019, Harley Race said that he regretted inventing the move due to all of the controversy it had created since its inception. The diving headbutt was used successfully throughout the second half of Harley Race's career to great effect. As is the way with anything innovative, Harley Race's diving headbutt has since become copied and evolved in the squared circle. One of those who picked up the mantle of the diving headbutt was the innovative high flyer come ring general, one half of the British Bulldogs, Tom Billington, the Dynamite Kid. 
there aren't enough superlatives to be able to describe the effect Dynamite Kid had on pro wrestling throughout his time using the diving headbutt in Europe, in Japan where he had his famous matches against the original Tiger Mask, and in the United States. It wasn't only his prevalent use of the diving headbutt which caused Dynamite Kid so many injuries. Even suffering a stroke and paralysis speculated heavily to be the result of compounded head injuries. Like Harley Race before him, Dynamite Kid himself influenced those who came after. Unfortunately, his life and career are tarred in misery and evil. Chris Benoit. Chris Benoit took the diving headbutt to new heights. At some times, literally, throwing himself from the top of a ladder or plummeting from the dizzying heights atop a steel cage. Chris Benoit also worked to show how smaller, talented wrestlers could main event and won the WWE title using the diving headbutt and now infamous crippler crossface submission. How much did falling from such heights and slamming his head into the mat or opponents damage Chris Benoit's brain? In an interview, Chris Benoit stated that in actuality he never got a concussion nor suffered any real injury from the diving attack, mentioning that it was his knees and wrists that showed the signs of wear and tear after years of using them to soften the blow of his fast-paced landings. However, in his book, A Fall for Old School Wrestling, Richard Berza said, performing this manoeuvre for the length of his 22-year career, the resulting concussions appear to have been the primary cause of Benoit's descent into madness, murder and suicide. In the modern day, we have the beloved Daniel Bryan, a man whose style, to Bryan's own admission, is heavily influenced by Chris Benoit and the Dynamite Kid. Seemingly, Bryan has little fear for trying out new and ever more impressive feats throughout his career, something which his years of training and career of hard work allows him to do with the utmost safety. As with every wrestler who has ever stepped into the squared circle, Daniel Bryan puts his body on the line every time he climbs between the ropes. No move in the American Dragon's moveset signifies this more than his use of the diving headbutt. Every person listed in this video has suffered serious head trauma. Daniel Bryan famously retired when not cleared to compete by WWE medical staff due to a chain of concussions which he suffered throughout his career. Dynamite Kid died after having a stroke and serious health issues later in life. Chris Benoit's situation has been well documented. How much the diving headbutt affected each of these cases is difficult to measure. Nonetheless, it says so much about a performer today when they are willing to traverse the turnbuckle and dive headfirst into the ground for us, the fans' pleasure. When Michael Benoit, Chris's father, gave Julian Bales of the Neurosurgery Unit at West Virginia University permission to examine his son's brain, the result shocked even this experienced professor. The scans of Benoit's brain showed severe damage to all four functioning lobes, as well as the brain stem itself. Benoit's brain was so severely damaged, it resembled the brain of an 85-year-old Alzheimer's patient, with clear signs of what scientists recognise today as CTE. When the Sports Legacy Institute approached Michael Benoit about testing Chris's brain as part of the Sports Legacy project, a goal was to determine if there was evidence of CTE caused by repeated trauma to the head sustained during Benoit's career. We have now confirmed multiple concussions are part of his medical history, along with clinical symptoms associated with CTE. Because my colleagues and I have found evidence of CTE in the brains of four former professional football players, we felt an examination of Chris Benoit's brain may bring awareness to CTE's existence outside of boxers and football players. The finding of CTE in Chris Benoit suggests that there may be a common syndrome amongst athletes who suffer multiple head injuries in contact sports. WWE was sceptical at first, with Vince McMahon and the board of directors seemingly keen to distance themselves from any connection to Benoit's brain damage. While this is a new emerging science, the WWE is unaware of the veracity of any of these tests. Dr. Omelu claims that Mr. Benoit had a brain that resembled an 85-year-old with Alzheimer's, which would lead one to ponder how Mr. Benoit would have found his way to an airport, let alone been able to remember all the moves and information that was required to perform in the ring. With the knowledge gained in the years since Benoit's death, 
better treatments and assessments have been developed in order to recognise signs of CTE earlier than ever before. This means that doctors are able to identify when a performer has suffered a concussion and work in order to protect them from further damage. This information simply wasn't as well understood or widespread back in 2007, and what a terrible shame it is too. Could things have played out differently if Chris had visited a doctor and been diagnosed with CTE? Could he have received the medical and psychological help he needed in order to slow the decay of his mind and personality? Perhaps. One thing's for sure, with all of the measures in place in WWE today, the chances of such serious brain damage within a performer happening on such a scale and going unnoticed are extremely low, which if nothing else, is one small slither of a silver lining from this dark and terrible cloud. This is the love that Chris and Nancy always had. He was peaceful and kept to himself. I think it had to be something personal, a domestic problem between him and his wife. Others have since speculated that Nancy and Chris Benoit were at breaking points in the years leading up to the murders. In May of 2003, Nancy Benoit had put in the paperwork to start divorce proceedings, citing domestic abuse. In 2003, Nancy Benoit filed for divorce and requested court-ordered protection from her husband Chris. However, by August of that year, the filings were retracted and the pair stayed married. At that time, felt that she wanted a divorce from Chris also felt apparently from the filing of the temporary protective order that she was in some sort of a danger from him. The Atlanta Journal-Constitution ran a story in 2008 which stated that Nancy Benoit had grown jealous of Chris and had accused him of having an extramarital affair with an unnamed female wrestler. The couple were also said to regularly argue about a life insurance policy by the same publication. Longtime friend and travelling companion to Benoit, hardcore Bob Holly, mentioned in his autobiography that when Chris would complain about Nancy, that was when the drinking would ensue, with Holly saying that every time an issue presented itself for the married pair, Benoit would attempt to blot out the disagreements with booze, something which Holly mentioned became more frequent towards the end of Benoit's life. A few years ago, she filed a domestic violence complaint against Benoit. Also, anabolic steroids are found in the house. That played a role, David Benoit said. That took a toll on him, man. When did he pass away? That man was his best friend. When one of WWE's most beloved stars, Eddie Guerrero, sadly died of a heart attack in 2005, it left a hole in his best friend, Benoit, which would never fully heal. Losing a loved one can affect people differently, but clearly Benoit, a normally stoic figure, was shattered by the news of his friend's passing. The two men had formed a deeply close friendship through their wrestling career and outside of the ring, and when that was ripped away from Benoit, some say that he never recovered emotionally. Seeing Chris's reaction on live television, even 16 years later, makes me choke up. Losing Eddie was one of the saddest days as a pro wrestling fan, so I can't begin to imagine how terrible it must have been within the WWE company that day. At 38, Guerrero was so young. His death so shocking you can understand how this may have had such an impact. We are left with a journal written by Benoit around this time which goes into morbid details about the depths of his despair after losing his closest friend. The entire situation is horrendous, but for me it's hard to truly connect with the horrors that occurred. It seems so foreign an act to be a part of such a brutal murder that as a bystander it can be hard to even wrap your head around it all. But the moment that Benoit lost Eddie stands out as something that so many of us can relate to. Losing a loved one, losing a friend, someone who you've shared so much of your life with just disappearing without a trace. It hurts and is easy to be empathetic towards. It was a terrible, terrible thing that happened in that household. As with so many things in life, I believe that this complex case is a psalm of many different things going horribly wrong at the same time. I don't think it's as clear and simple as saying that Chris Benoit took steroids and the induced rage forced him to kill his family. Perhaps some side effects of prolonged anabolic performance enhancers played a role, but could anyone honestly say that these substances caused Benoit to snap any more than his proven brain damage or his reportedly stressful home environment? 
In 2007, Chris Benoit was living a fast-paced and highly demanding lifestyle, juggling his long travels around the country to wrestling shows, in-ring action and substance abuse. Pair that with a wife who doesn't want to be married to you anymore and a lifetime of physical damage to your body, and you have a concoction of circumstances which would cause the pressure to boil for anyone in a similar situation. Now, I'm not by any means saying that simply because of these factors, Chris Benoit has an excuse or was justified in his actions, he wasn't. I think that what he did is disgusting and under no circumstances excusable, but with the hordes of information we now have, it is at least possible to begin to understand the boiling pot which may have led to this sad, sad situation. When I was growing up, Chris Benoit was one of my favourite wrestlers. His rugged look and pumped up physique, paired with his sublime in-ring ability, captured my attention and made me an instant fan. His entrance music, in my humble opinion, is the greatest wrestling theme of all time. I have an old Chris Benoit shirt from this period as well as an action figure. I performed the throat slit gesture and the diving headbutt when wrestling on a trampoline at my friend's house, just like Chris. I've remained a massive pro wrestling fan since those days and, and have a huge sense of nostalgia for the late 90s and early 2000s WWE, but simply put, I just can't ever see myself forgiving what Benoit did. To think how much these actions affected me on an emotional level at the time opens my eyes to the pain and suffering which the family and close friends of, of Benoit must still feel to this day. I can't begin to imagine how their lives were turned upside down or the work they've had to put in to gain some semblance of normality in their everyday. As I've grown older, I find myself disagreeing with the direction in which WWE is travelling more and more. However, I can't deny that I fully understand and to some extent agree with the decision to try and clear Chris Benoit from their history. Whilst researching for this video, I've gone back and watched numerous Benoit matches, hours of his on-screen performances, interviews and promos, and not for one moment whilst I was watching all of this did the thoughts of Chris Benoit's final actions leave my mind. I'm just some random wrestling fan, thousands of miles and years removed from the incident, and the vision of the horror still seems fresh in my mind, and no amount of grappling skill or awesome entrance music will ever change that fact. Thanks for watching.